This year, I give a talk on, on computer vision with a focus on deep learning based computer vision applications. Um, just to uh, first give an idea of how uh, you know, ubiquitous deep learning has become in many computer vision applications, um, essentially, that's, that's a, in the last three, four years, it's a big gap in, in performance, in quality. So for, for many applications, you actually, if you're willing to sacrifice the speed of processing, you can, you can deliver uh, typically much improved performance for your application. So these are examples um, that I didn't do in Mathematica that other people have done in their own software, but this is a case of uh, uh, for self-driving cars where you, you just annotate every pixel in the image and say that it's a car, that it's a road, it's a building and whatnot. Um, it's not that uh, it was impossible to do uh, phase detection before. Uh, you can do that in Mathematica and it's fast, but uh, if you do it with a deep learning technique, more recent, you'll get better performance in terms of quality. So, um, of course, this is uh, another example that you should, you should uh, be uh, pretty aware of, which is uh, for recognition, and uh, this is our own image identify that uh, recognize this uh, bombina bombina uh, correctly as uh, this type of uh, toad. Um, but there are, for, for in computer vision, there are also some, some really, excuse me, some really uh, puzzling results, really. Um, that's, for example, this is an application about uh, death estimation from a single image. So you take just one picture, and the algorithm is able to recover the depth, the normals in the scene, and also do segmentation all at once. So, and, and this is from one image only. So the, the, the fact that uh, based on training data, the algorithm is able to uh, you know, find its representation and achieve uh, this type of very hard task is, is pretty impressive. And um, this is, the last example I want to show, um, I apologize for the image quality, but um, this is what a deep learning algorithm can do to uh, linearly go from this bedroom to that bedroom, to this bedroom here. So uh, this is the features that are the, the picture representation that are learned by the network, and you just do linear uh, you know, blending of the features of this image and this image, and this is what you find here. Um, I, I find this rather phenomenal. Uh, th there's more possible images uh, one of size 100 by 100 than there's atoms in, on the universe, and yet uh, the deep learning network manages to, uh, you know, make it linear. So uh, you see here, this is a, t uh, a bedroom with a TV, and it gets transformed into a, into a window, and, and th there's not a single of this image that clearly is not a potential bedroom. So um, in, in this talk, we are not going to work on this application, but uh, instead you know, show some of the, of the ones and also give a, an intuition of how you should develop your own applications uh, based on deep learning for computer vision. So uh, uh, first, the, that, that might be a repeat for those of you who have attended the other deep learning presentations, but anyway, some of you will might learn a few things. Um, this network is essentially uh, a pipeline of layers, and um, each layer takes inputs, computes something, and pass it along to the next step. So um, this is the classical example that is in the documentation everywhere. Um, it's used for here for a classification task. It takes as input uh, images and uh, gets as output uh, a label, airplane, automobile, whatnot. But um, w what I would like you to uh, better understand is how it works. Um, so you see, this is the pipeline of operation. The image goes through a convolution layer, then, I mean, all these layers are, are there. And, Towards the end, you, you have uh, features that have been learned, and these features are, are just uh, able to linearly classify uh, your, your data. So, uh, if you look at, at this, um, let's look at, at these three here and see what they do. And, and hopefully that gives you a, a feel of um, what's going on in this network. 
So this is, uh, I just want to do these three. Convolution followed by uh, ramp followed by a pulling. So what, what will go on when an image is going through that? So let's first look at uh, this one, convolution. So um, you see that it has 20 output channels and the kernel size is five by five. And um, so it takes as input uh, three because I have three channels, RGB, and then 32 by 32, and gets this output 20 by 28 by 28. So actually, um, and, and this is my, my toad that I have resized to 32 by 32. So um, this network don't take as input an image. This is a misconception. What they take as input is a volume. So um, uh, this is what, what the network is, is starting with. So uh, RGB is, is being processed together. So you have a stack of, of uh, three channels here as input. And this is what we had seen in the network. Um, these are the param some parameters for inside the convolution layer. And you see that after essentially you go through that layer, you will have an output, which is uh, just the result of making a convolution of the, the 3D volume with each of the 20 kernel and adding the bias. So um, after your image has been through that, uh, that first convolutional layer, it looks like that. So th these are the features that will carry on in your network. So uh, that, that's uh, then the dimension that we expect. And after this, so you can think about that as some type of template matching. So uh, each of these 20 kernels, they can uh, fire if you have something that looks like a, an edge, a little circle, or things like that. And um, after this, you have a, a step which, which in, um, introduces a nonlinearity when you combine this, um, this input. So uh, typically, you use a ramp. So if it's negative, nothing. If it's positive, you let it go. So it's like a switch. So that means that um, you, you, you have these templates. Maybe they fire, maybe they don't. And uh, this type of switch allow you to uh, decide how to group them. So um, as you go across the network, uh, at some point, maybe a car is something that has two round circles in the front and, uh, and not a rectangle on the left or something like that. So um, the last operation that I, I've not showed is, is pooling, which consists in essentially shrinking uh, and reducing the resolution. So um, the, the underlying uh, trick is that um, Essentially, that field is differentiable computing. So you assemble these little blobs, and in order for it to be trainable, you need to be able to uh, know if I change a little the parameters, how is it going to affect my output? And um, so the key is that each of these layers, uh, you need to be able to apply the chain rule so that in a single evaluation through the network, you can compute your forward activations as well as compute the gradients for each layer. So in only one evaluation of the network, you compute both the output as well as the gradients that go from the output to the input. So um, this, is, this is, you know, all these layers, you need that, else you essentially uh, you cannot train efficiently. Um, so the key uh, when you do uh, deep learning is that essentially you, you try to become this artist, uh, and I use this word because it requires some mileage to do it well. Um, and, and you need to design a network so that, so that you kind of uh, see that uh, the gradients are, are, going to, are going to be well propagating backwards uh, so that you can, you can compute this efficiently and therefore you can uh, use this simple optimization technique based on stochastic gradient descent, which is, um, oh, I'm, I'm asking for trouble. Um, all right, let me clear F. All right, so, um, and then you have these millions of parameters in your network, and all you do is essentially this, okay? You start from initial condition, and you just go down, down, down until you reach a local minima. So 
if you have ever worked on optimization, you, here you have problems with 100 million parameters. So it, it's very tricky to train properly. Um, and, and that's where the skill come into play. Uh, for example, well, in this case, if I change the parameter alpha of my gradient descent, I, I can converge faster, but if I make it too big, then I diverge, right? So, um, and this is, you know, very easy function. Imagine that in a, in a space with 100 million parameters. So, um, that, that's, that's it for, uh, you know, what I wanted to convey, give some intuition about the network. So, now, um, let's look at uh, how you would change your mind frame and start working on your problems using deep learning. So let's look at this panda. And uh, um, it's a panda, okay. Um, but what Im image identifier can do is that you can say, okay, uh, what if this panda w were food? And, and, and give me the, the 10 most well and give me the probability. So, you know, if you do that, obviously uh, you get an answer, but uh, you know, that, that's, that's the probability is rather low. So there's no, there's no problem here. Um, now, if I have this new panda, that, that looks pretty much the same as the other one. Well, it's a panda. But um, now if I, if I ask for foods, then, uh, then now the network thinks it's 90% confident that this panda is a, is a pastry. So, uh, you know, th this is a classifier, so there's nothing really fantastic about this result. You don't need a deep, deep network to, to do that. But it's just that um, you, they can be fooled. So uh, how do you make this fooling thing happen? So if you do it, uh, you know, traditionally, um, you define an objective function that uh, takes your input image, adds a little delta to it, then you pass it through image identifier, you ask for the top probability that it's food, and uh, well, if the parameters are too big, you just uh, add the penalty, because you want a little change, and then you, you maximize this. Okay, so, so th uh, this is the way typically you, you do that before. So if you do that, you, you take like the, the big machine from the company, you, you spend three, four days uh, full time on, with eight kernels and uh, 20 gigabytes memory, and uh, you got the panda. Uh, alternatively, you can use, uh, you can design your little network, like, like this one. So l let me explain what I'm, I'm doing here. Uh, this network has, input, uh, has the image as inputs. It has also another input, which is um, the, what is my, my target delta? So I want small delta, so I, this is another input. And also, the last in, I also give the, the, the probability I want. So here I will say that I want this output probability to be very close from uh, my pastry. So what's going on in, in this network? I take the input, I add a little delta, I pass it through uh, image identify network, and uh, then get the output class. And uh, so this gets optimized. Um, at the same time, I also want delta to be little, very small. So this is another loss that I have. And, and that's it, I optimize this. And you know, the output will be, uh, this is my output of the network as well. So if you do that, you don't need to spend three days and 20 gigab bytes of memory, uh, it, it's pre you're pretty much done in two, you know, one minute on your laptop. Uh, that requires, um, so, and why? Because you, all of these little steps are differentiable, so essentially you, you, ha you have all these parameters, but th that converges uh, super quickly. So, okay, so, um, that, that, that was somehow uh, uh, an introduction. Now, I want to debunk a few myths as well for that, so, uh, you hear that, yeah, you need uh, to design your own network, it's, it's, you, know, you need uh, some artistic skills for that, and you need the big data, and you need a massive GPU to do your work. It, it's not necessarily true. Uh, for example, for an architecture, if you don't know what you're doing, uh, then just take something that is there, and that will work for you, most probably. Uh, so we have zoos in, well, we will have zoos in Mathematica, but there's many other models you can find. Uh, and if you really need, you, you make some adjustment to it, but you don't, don't, don't necessarily try to find something, you know. Don't boil a Death Star if you don't start, like just start playing with it. 
Now, um, in terms of data, yeah, you do need data, but if you don't have a lot, uh, what you should do is uh, start from a pre-trained model and uh, you know just make a little change to it based on your data. So you start from image identify and you, you give new training data and you change it a bit so it's work for your data. You can also synthesize new samples. So and, and then if you have one computer with a good single NVIDIA GPU, you can do a lot already. Uh, and if it, at some point you need more, you can go for the, the big job somewhere else. Um, okay, so yeah, hyperparameters, I'm skipping that. So um, this is something that uh, I think was already uh, mentioned, but uh, this is, if you, if you just want to use image identify features, uh, if feature extract will do that and uh, you know, give you a panda, give you some features. And, and this allows you to do a out of core. Uh, this is completely out of core. So you have here some, some URL of uh, the top 100 monuments. I, I've not even looked at the picture to tell you the truth. Um, and then you extract the features for, from image identify. And um, you know, once you, you have it, you just, uh, if you want to see well, what's going on with the Wolfram Alpha Eiffel Tower, you know, this is the top five results. I, again, it's a very simple thing, and I've not looked at the images, so I, I'm just claiming, that, you know, it's just how you would, uh, just how you would use, uh, like, it's, it's there for you, image identifies features. Uh, so now let's work on an application which is uh, the quality uh, estimation of an image. So these are our data set where people are, are rating images, and they say if it's good or bad, and uh, they give a score, one is very bad, and 100 is excellent. So you have like a thousand image, a few thousand uh, ratings. Um, so these are the type of images you have. Uh, for example, uh, that animal here has a rating of 37, a standard deviation of 17, which is pretty high, and uh, well, the category is poor. Um, so you have this, and, and the goal is to uh, you know, have the computer learn how to produce this number here. All right. So. Um, here, what I'm going to do is uh, I will start from uh, uh, an image identify type of model. Uh, I think I won't have time to run into any details. Um, I will just make changes to uh, these uh, very small changes. I'm just going to drop this last layer, and I'm going to replace the, this. I keep all these, and I just replace these two layers, and uh, so that these new layers will be adapted to my problem. So this is what I will do. If I put this to my panda, I get uh, 2,048 features, and uh, I, I replace uh, I replace the last layer by by new layers on my own. This little end net. So um, there's I want to mention here. I don't have a lot of data, so I do some data augmentation by uh, so I, I'm kind of doing some random cropping inside my image to get more data for free. Uh, so I, I take some small portions, and that allows me uh, pretty much to uh, inflate as, as much as I want my data sets with, of course, there's some prime. So in the end, I have these features for each image. I have scores and, and now a set of features for each crop. Um, once, you know, another trick is to maybe balance your, your training set. So I have, I have a training set which is a bit disbalanced here. So um, I just make it make it like that and um, compute training testing sets. I'm skipping this. All right, and now I'm going to uh, to train that. All right. So I I'm taking this massive network that has been trained on on massive computers for for weeks, and I just changed the end, so it's pretty quick. And um, all right, so then you know you, you can use it. You you see that it's not performing great, but at the same time the standard deviations are so high in this data set that you know it's fine. You know the excellent images are never bad; they're mostly excellent or good, for example. So um, you know then you just uh, in the end. Let me let me move on so I have time to show you a bit uh, other applications I have in mind. In the end, I, I can I have this feature, so now I can use predict on, on my features, and um, 
Oh, still running. All right. Okay. So um, you know, Predict found the, the pretty uh, uh, found there was uh, some need for stronger realization, and um, let me see if that was already pre-computed. That will save some time. Okay, so this is the results here. So, um, you know, the, the correlation coefficient is okay, I mean 65, and, um, and this is what it should be, and this is what we have. So, if ideally it would be on the diagonal, so that's, uh, we are doing kind of okay around this area, center area. All right, so this is how you would, uh, then, when you have an image, now in the end what you do, you extract the features, that you have fine-tuned, and uh, they are using as input the features from image identify type, right? And uh, I do that on 20 crops, and I take the average. So since I'm running out of time, I'll just do on two crops. Right. Um, I, I did mention that it was not, the speed was not, you know, the, the, the essence of uh, this type of application. All right, so 53 for this picture of uh, Superman's house. All right, so um, I have, I have uh, a few minutes left to, uh, for my last application, which is action recognition from video. So it's kind of a, a very small data set. It's uh, one, 101 type of actions. There's about 13,000 videos, 200 images per video. Um, so if uh, this is one of them, it's always funny to look at videos. Let's do that. All right, so th this is one video for YoYo. This is the UU activity. Okay, so this is the type of thing we want to, so uh, let me point out this is a toy, you know, in, in a few years, uh, we won't do action recognition like that because uh, you have thousands of objects, you have even more thousands of ways to interact with them, so you cannot do a class for each of them. But anyway, this is this paper. You take a sequence, a video sequence, you have one classifier using at a single image, and this is some type of image identifier again. And here you have also another classifier. This, this one encodes temporal information, and this is based on optical flow. And then you combine them together. Um, I, will, I won't show you what optical flow looks like, but hopefully you have, you have an idea. Uh, um, you know, this is, it gives a vector field, so that tells you that that point here on the next image is actually there. So this is encoding the motion. Um, instead of using the, the paper, we're using this, uh, this Google Net in a version one. Uh, why? Because it's more modern, so it works better, it's less memory, so it's all good. And uh, I do out-of-core training. So my training sets compose of a list of files and a uh, you know, list of classes. There's almost two million images for training, 700,000 for testing. So this is not for your laptop, uh, not mine for sure. And, um, you know, so if you take a ran pass a random image through that, uh, I did not know it would do that, but I I'm not unhappy about it. Um, so the random image is military parade, all right. So, um, but th this, is, this is what uh, I want you to, uh, to see. Um, this is like tricks. Uh, first, I, I, this net trains options. First, I, I said that uh, use GPU number one. That way, if you have a machine with several GPUs, you can run several training at the same time. Just change your GPU number. Then uh, here, I use stochastic, I, I do some type of fine tuning where I take, I start from this image identify network, and what I do, I, I put a, a rate for the gradient descent, which is very little. And that will mean that I'm going to change my network, but not too much. Ideally, I would prefer to keep it frozen, but uh, we cannot do it in version 11. So uh, just little changes allowed. And uh, this uh, option here tells that every two hours, you need to save uh, whatever best model you have so far. I mean, that would be pretty idiotic to not do that, right? Else you would spend days and maybe waste your work waiting for a result. No, no one would uh, no, maybe do that, maybe. Uh, so do that. Um, and then, you know, this is how it, it, it will, it's looking like uh, after you have done training it, so no. This is the batch, so the date, training data, and this is the validation, so pretty nice. Okay, and um, 
Okay, oh, it's red, all right. Um, all right, so now I have my, my uh, spatial uh, net. So now the temporal net from the optical flow. Um, well, I, I, I'm running out of time for the delivery, but I was running out of computer time for the training. So let me tell you uh, a bit. Well, well I'm, I'm just jumping on, on possible issues that I have encountered. Uh, optical flow takes time, so you need to pre-compute that, okay? Um, so, and you need to save as images because out of core only works with images. And it has a big, it takes, a, it has a big footprint. Uh, each image, if you store the optical flow as a real 32, you know, in the end, um, it will, um, you will arrive here with uh, more than 17 terabytes of data, okay? So that, that's, that's way too much. Uh, if on top of that, your, your red partition where your data is stored is, is starting to crash, uh, then you have to do something, uh, like reduce, have less data, and so forth. Um, so um, this actually, this happened to me. So um, I just had enough, enough mo one model I have, Where's my model? This is, this is the result of a snapshot that Ned Train gave me a few hours ago. Um, I made the mistake of not doing checkpointing, all right? So I, that stuff has been running for 20 hours and I have only one model. If I had done checkpointing every two hours, I would not be like I am now. Um, but the thing is that this model, I tried it, it's no good yet because it has not trained enough, okay? So um, this is uh, pretty much what would be left to do after this. It would just be to fuse the spatial and temporal nets. But as I mentioned, I run into hardware problems and other things. So uh, thank you. Uh, these are just a kind of a little list of features that I would love to see soon in uh, that the machine learning people, I'm sure, are going to implement that very quickly. Uh, that will help with uh, computer vision applications when you develop your own. So um, I see the next speaker must be getting ready. If you have a few questions, I'll be happy to take them while we transition.